we should uh, uh, we should start probably now. Uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, to all, all the joiners who are, who are very happy to have uh, this very first uh, public event uh, uh, today, uh, organized by, by, by our association Green of the WA. Uh, and and uh, uh, we have a very specific topic uh, that we will uh, 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 that Jean Baptiste will introduce you, to you in a minute around quantum computing and with the support of uh, 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 a multiverse, of course. Uh, uh, I'll take the opportunity uh, 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 of, the, of this public meeting to give a, a quick update on Green RWA. I know, you know for all the members, you probably know already all this, but uh, it's always good to look at, at the latest numbers, the latest figures. Uh, 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 and then we'll jump right into the subject. So I, I'll try to be no longer than five minutes uh, on Green RWA before Jean-Baptiste introduces the main topic of today. Uh, uh, so Green RWA uh, is a network uh, we, we founded uh, in uh, July 2020 with the view of uh, 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 creating awareness on the on the role of banks in the green economy, and that's pretty much uh, done today. If you look at the financial institution around the world, they are very very active now in uh, putting together a net zero uh, target for 2050 and start uh, 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 processing and uh, and uh, reprocessing the way they they, they onboard uh, uh, loans, uh, sometimes under the regulation constraints. Uh, uh, but also very actively uh, by themselves. Uh, it's uh, all, also today, and the main focus of the of the association today is to promote uh, methodologies to quantify banks' climate risk. And uh, uh, this is specifically uh, uh, through the sum model that we designed uh, uh, with Jean Baptiste in the first version uh, as founders of the association in in the summer 2020, and then with the help of a mathematician Jocelyn Garnier at Ecole Polytechnique and. Uh, with Anne Gruz, uh, uh later on and with new uh, latest uh, 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 publication being selected by the Institut Louis Bachelier in France uh, for their uh, uh, webinar in a, in a few weeks, seminar in a few weeks now that we are back on a physical event. Uh, of course, the, the next goal of the session will be to track and measure bank action. Uh, there, there, there are many, many things going on already there today, so we'll have to assess how we can specifically contribute on that goal, but our second goal is the main. Uh, 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 today we have 80 members as individual, nine corporate members, including Finastra, which is a very large fintech uh, that some of you uh, probably know. We have ambassadors in, in, in US, uh, in UK and in Paris and in, uh, uh, sorry, in Asia too. So uh, we're getting more and more uh, larger and larger reach and we're engaging on a, on, a, on a weekly basis with our community. Of course, we have uh, almost 2,000 uh, wide uh, LinkedIn followers uh, uh, contact base and also with the financial actors because this is a, a lot about you know uh, creating awareness about our, on our role. Just to give you an idea of where we are now, at the international institution uh, level, uh, we, we are progressing uh, on a monthly basis. We were organizing our second meeting with ECB uh, in a matter of days uh, after a successful presentation of the model approach. We have, met, we have met the IMF in January, the European Commission in January, uh, the Fed in November, and we're hopefully we'll talk to them again uh, in the first uh, uh, semester of 2022. Uh, UNEP, FI, and GAP are also uh, entities we are talking to regularly. Uh, they are very uh, active also in a climate-related financial risk area. Uh, uh, what we see today uh, in, in 2022, and I think it, it, it will happen this year, and if not next year, is that regulators, central banks, uh, international institutions are positioning uh, the way they want to embed and embark uh, climate risk into uh, 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 the regulatory pillars. Uh, uh, like pillar one, pillar two, or pillar three. So it's a critical year for us. We have a very big focus to make sure we, we push as much as possible this kind of uh, framework uh, that can uh, that can help transition more money toward green uh, investment through financial institutions and banks specifically. Uh, so that, that that's uh, uh, that's my five minutes on the, on the 
on the, the, the association one world about our latest tool for our members only. Uh, it's a documentation center uh, that Walid, uh, our marketing manager, has been working on very actively with the support of some of our, some of our members. And I, I thank them here for their, for their help and their time. Uh, it's a very uh, handy tool to be able to get information uh, about uh, 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 about, about the whole ecosystem of uh, green finance and, and energy. Uh, and this is what finishing here on the climate extended risk model, of course. Uh, uh, so for, for the members, you already have access to it and for anybody wanting to join and uh, both you know, learning more about climate financial risk and support of our work, uh, uh, any corporate is welcome. Uh, I show here uh, the membership uh, fees uh, on a yearly basis. In corporate are 2,000, individual 200, and student 20. Uh, uh, so we hope we know you, you can onboard and help us uh, so spread the knowledge about our, our methodology uh, uh, on climate-related financial risk. And I will, at this point, hand over the, the mic to Jean-Baptiste so that he introduces uh, uh, the main topic of the day. Thank you, um, thank you Olivier. Thank you all for uh, taking this time. So, some of you may know that 40 years ago, in the early 90s, 80s, Richard Feynman shown that quantum effects cannot be simulated by a classic computer. And it was the birth of the revolutionary quantum computing paradigm. Today, together, we wonder if the net zero transition can even be achieved without the help of quantum computer. With climate change, we face a physical challenge. We must optimize energy plants, batteries, fertilizer, chemistry, logistic networks. All of this simulation requires exponential calculation time on classic computer, whose Moore law is facing the quantum limits, making them more and more energy poor. And quantum computer pioneers, such as David Dutch or Peter Shaw, discovered efficient quantum algorithms to solve those combinatorial problems, making the development of quantum computers at scale one of the biggest tech challenge of all time. Today, Green WWE, whose objective is to achieve this net zero transition, is extremely proud and honored to welcome Multiverse, a leading quantum tech company, which is taking on this fantastic challenge. So Michel and Sam, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Uh, I will share my uh, presentation in a few seconds. So, uh, meantime, uh, before we start, uh, we would like to thank uh, Jean-Baptiste, Olivier, Walid, and all the Green RWA team for organizing this webinar. Did you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So our aim today is to talk effectively about the so-called second revolution in quantum technologies and to give you a retrospective vision, a prospective vision, sorry, of the application of quantum computing, in particular in the field of energy, sustainability and finance. So here is our agenda. First of all, I am talking about the second revolution, but what about the first revolution? I will then present quickly some fundamental principles of quantum physics and the concept of qubit, quantum bit. We will then list various fields of applications and the associated challenges. You will uh, understand that mastering this new quantum technology, as Jean-Baptiste said, could enable us to solve a number of problems that are becoming more and more prevalent in our society such as those linked to the environmental impact of certain classical technology. We will get, then go over some existing applications 
has developed by Multiverse to go finally to the conclusion. So just to lighten the mood uh, straight away, I know that your day has already been long or will be long, so don't worry. If you don't understand everything, it's normal. As it has been said by Richard Feynman, so the famous uh, Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965. So we talk about the second revolution, but what about the first one? Well, have a look on this picture. It's an early device made possible by the first quantum revolution. Perhaps you recognize it. It's uh, the first programmable electronic computer, the famous ENIAC, picture here in the 1940s. If we uh, keep traveling in time, something that we must note is that first of all, it's important to know that quantum mechanics, which is the basis for quantum technologies, is over a century old. It's uh, the branch of theoretical physics that studies and describes the fundamental phenomena at work in physical systems at the atomic or subatomic levels. Here, you have a nice picture from the Solvay Conference held in 1927 that has been Im immortalized in uh, this recent colored photo. And it brought together the greatest mathematicians and physicists of their time. You can certainly know some, some of the names, like uh, Schrodinger, Paoli, but of course Einstein and Marie Curie, the only woman in this picture. And we must know that 17 of these 29 personalities uh, present at the time have won a Nobel Prize and six were already laureates at the time of the meeting. So over the last 100 years, the quantum mechanics have led to inventions like transistors or lasers that are the basic elements of our uh, computers and smartphones. So we can definitely say that the first quantum revolution led to our information and telecommunication civilization. But the common denominator of all these inventions is that they exploit particles like atoms, electrons, or photons in their great mass without being able to distinguish them a classical laser emits 10 to the 20 photons per second. But now, a second revolution is on the way. As Serge Aros, a French Nobel Prize, said, indeed, since the 80s, the parallel and continuous progress in research and technology has allowed us to develop the ability to manipulate quantum objects at the individual level. And this, this to such an extent that we, we can store now, process and read information in such quantum objects. So the second revolution, the second quantum revolution is above all an information revolution. And so our ability to control atoms, ions and even photons is enabling the emergence of a new generation of devices, some of which are already on the market. These devices could revolutionize fields as varied as sensors, telecommunication, and computing, as they would surpass the performance of existing technology. As far as sensor or metrology are concerned, the extreme sensitivity of quantum objects to external influences makes them ideal for measuring physical quantity with high precision. Regarding the encrypted telecommunication, we are already under the threat from a future quantum computer whose exponential computing power could break the crypto system currently in use. But certain principles of quantum mechanics would provide a quantum solution to the quantum threat and thus guarantee unconditional security for our communication and personal data. And finally, by exploiting principles of quantum mechanics, Quantum computers could perform calculations that are totally inaccessible to classical supercomputers, which will benefit many industries such as chemistry. So today, we are unable to perfectly reproduce, for instance, the behavior of a molecule of caffeine. So what is behind the curtain? Before going into the detail of such application, let me quickly explain some key concepts of quantum mechanics. First principle, the quanta or quantification. 
You must know that in the quantum world, particles are only allowed certain levels of energy. It's a bit like climbing a staircase. You can stop on one step or the next, but never between two steps. And these energy levels make it possible to understand the structure of atoms and to create those new technological tools. We will see that as long as these two levels are sufficiently distinct, you can create what are called quantum bits or qubits uh, that conventionally represent zero or one. The second principle is the wave particle duality. We must imagine that an electron, along, as long as we don't wish to observe it or to measure it, it's like, it's behaving like a wave which move, which bounce, which interfere. Traditionally, the great letter psi usually represents this wave function from the physicist's point of view for a quantum object. And so a quantum object has both particle and wave properties and as such is likely to interface like a classical wave and so can create greater, lower or null amplitude. Another very important principle is a superposition. So a, a classical system can only be in one state at a time. For example, you take a coin and in principle, there is only two possible states at rest, either heads or tails. A quantum system can exist in several states at once, called a superposition of states. The wave function of such a superposition state can be described actually as a linear combination of the wave function of the contributing states. And thus, you can see this picture with uh, this spinning, uh, spinning uh, coin. The quantum coin toss can be simultaneously on the head and tail side. But beware that, however, the superposition state is very frag fragile because it is sensitive to unwanted interaction coming from the environment. And so these states are said to be sensitive to decoherence. The last, and to finish this section, there is another amazing property, which is named entanglement which has no equivalent in classical mechanics. Entanglement corresponds to the situation where the quantum states are of several quantum objects depends instantaneously on each other, even if the objects are very far apart. To illustrate, let's consider two quantum objects, both in superposition, those two coins. You make them interact, and then imagine that we super separate them, it can be billions of kilometers away from each other. Well, entanglement states that if you measure one of the objects and find a certain value, then you will find exactly the same value on the other object, even if you measure it at the same time. So finally, the system is more complex than these uh, single parts of the system. It brings us to, uh, to some additional vocabulary. I would like now to introduce the notion of quantum bit or qubit, which represents uh, the smallest storage unit of quantum information. So you know that the unit of information in the classical digital world is a bit, which can take two values, zero or one, and classically in traditional computing, it generally corresponds to an electrical charge zero or five volts, they can pass through transistors, which can be seen as a switch on, off, zero or one. In quantum information theory, the basic unit of information is a quantum bit or qubit, which designates the quantum states of a physical quantum object, atom, electron, or photons, having two possible basic states, namely generally noted zero and one with this strange little, little bracket here, but it's convenient to represent the states on, uh, of these qubits on a, a sphere, which is called a, a block, block sphere. So you, you can see on, the, on this uh, chart that we have the zero at, at the North Pole, uh, the one at the South Pole, and in fact, each point on the surface of the sphere is a representation, a representation of a valid quantum state, which may be a superposition of states. And according to the position, if the point is more on the North hemisphere, we will be more uh, weighted towards the state zero, but anyway, we will be in, in superposition between zero and one. Okay, what, what is the power of quantum uh, capacity? Two to the power, two to the n. Well, why? 
Uh, let's take a conventional uh, three bits register that can represent two to the three, that is uh, eight different pieces of information that can be uh, stored in the register, but only once uh, at a time. A register of three qubits can represent or process the equivalent of those eight bits. And if we generalize n qubits will be the equivalent of n bits. And in a classical system, so in order to process all the possible combinations, one will to perform sequential or serial calculation. But in quantum, everything can be done in parallel. I put some quote, but you will understand later why. What does it mean in terms of uh, memory storage and computing power? On the left hand side, uh, we can see that, for instance, the requirement in terms of classical bits uh, compared to qubits when it comes to store all the parameters that will describe a specific chemical, chemical stru structure, you can see that the limit today of storage is around uh, 10 to the power, uh, actually, uh, 40, uh, sorry, uh, 12, 12 uh, qubit, uh, bits, and uh, which is about the, the, the number of parameters that we'll have uh, uh, with the ethanol molecule. Um, on the right hand side, I illustrate the exponential computing power for addressing a specific problem, which is actually breaking uh, the RSA key, which is, you know, at the heart of crypto system in our uh, modern internet. On the Y uh, X axis, you have the, the measure of the complexity of a problem, and on the ordinate, the time it will take to solve it. The curve in gray, for classical computers reflects the exponential increase in time required. And effectively, if you put your cursor on the around uh, 2000, which is around the size of the RSA key today, you see that uh, we will be, have a, a time necessary above the uh, age of the universe. And we have uh, at the top of the ordinate scale, we, are, we have 1 billion years already. On the contrary, on the, if you look at the green side and green curve, you see what will be the time to break the RSC, RSC with different uh, lengths with a quantum computer. And you see it's a linear, linear curve. That's why we are talking about the ex exponential speed up of quantum computer compared to classical computer for some kind of problems. So let's go now for some application of quantum com Technologies. I've already mentioned that our ability to exploit the quantum physics at the particle level leaves us with a wide field of application in the area of communication, sensor, basic science. But for the sake of time, we will just detail few applications now in quantum computing. Let's go back to the pay point mentioned by Jean Baptiste regarding conventional computing. I would like to say a few words about that to illustrate the fact that technological and physical barriers are inexorably approaching, which could limit uh, their future development. Uh, if you look at the le uh, left uh, hand side, we can judge the slowing down of Moore's laws or even its hands. Uh, that is often mentioned as one of the reasons for development of alternatives to conventional technologies. In its uh, most recent version, Moore's law stated that the transistor density, so the number of transistors per square millimeters, uh, and therefore the computing power of conventional computers will double every 80 or uh, 24 months. On the, and you can see actually that if we correlate this transistor density with the computing power across the year, we can see that the, the gradual decline of uh, in additional uh, computing power over the years. The performance of individual processors has only increased by 3.5% per year since 2015. We, we see effectively the slowdown. So how IT has addressed this issue. They have decided to put in, in parallel several single CPU. So the development of parallel architecture has helped to mitigate this issue. 
But parallelization has its own limit uh, because simply you must uh, make the different CPU communi communicate be between them. So it's so called the uh, Adam's law that is a little less known than Moore's law, but effectively we, we can see on the uh, bottom right hand side um, the, the, the graphic which is representing the evolution of the highest, uh, more powerful supercomputer over 50 years. And those are using uh, parallelism, and we see effectively that there is a decline in the in the slope over the last uh, the last uh, couple of years. So we can see why quantum computers with exponential computing power are being touted as a promising solution to the pain point, and we must know that there are today several types of quantum computers and different physical platforms or potential qubit types uh, with different technologies, maturities as well. And for the sake of time, once again, uh, we're not able to go into the detail, but let's mention a few points. First, I would like to talk about the quantum emulators, which are used to simulate the execution of quantum algorithms of untraditional computers. So it's not a quantum computer, but at present, classical computers can simulate up to 40 to 50 qubits, and that's all. In the quantum computer world, there are many two classes, analog computers and digital computers, based on a quantum logic gate, like uh, the classical logic gate, more sophisticated, but same logic. In the family of analog quantum computers, the simulation of the dynamics of quantum system is the most natural and obvious application of quantum computers. We find again the Richard Feynman's idea that the simulation of natural process should be carried out more quickly by a computer that would itself exploit the particularities of quantum physics to increase its computing power. So quantum annealing computers fall in this uh, category. They are already marketed by, for instance, the Canadian firm D-Wave. They are, they can be used as of today for certain types of problems like optimization or chemistry simulation. On uh, the left uh, side, the uh, right side, sorry, we have the universal family. Uh, as you have understood, uh, quantum systems are sensitive to their environment and decurrence and decohere very quickly, which create actually errors in calculation. So a current research focus is the creation of mathematical models to correct these errors. But the, but the challenges are such that universal quantum error correction computers will only be available in 10 to 15 years, according to experts. But we will come back later on this one. By then, between now and 10 years or 15 years, we will be living in the era of NISC computers, so NISC for noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. So these NISC computers are starting to emerge, and for example, from IBM prototypes uh, available via the cloud, but there is a, a tens of different NISC computer provider. And so these NIST computers will have between 50 to few hundred physical qubits without error correction. What we can say is that while they may not be accurate enough to revolutionize the world, they will demonstrate that the technology used and the algorithm are valid, and that by interacting with a traditional quantum computer, concrete application may emerge, and even that some tasks beyond the capacity of traditional computers could be achieved. <coughs> there are, as I said, there is many ways to build a qubit, and researchers at universities, startups, and traditional computer companies are interested in, in them. I will not elaborate here, but each platform has uh, its advantages, or disadvantages, some work at room temperature, others require ultra low temperature and so a cryostar and so a energivore, others are more or less scalable. No one can say today which technology will be the winner and uh, actually several of them could be. Here is a chart, uh, uh, an illustration of some selected names per, per qubit uh, platform. 
and also a broader list of academics and industry also per qubit platform. You, you can see effectively there is a lot of groups working on that. So now let's look about the use case. So there, there, there are several families of quantum and hybrid algorithms that can be as of today applied in different sectors of activity from chemistry to machine learning to physics, etc. We spoke about the RSC key, uh, factoring uh, with a famous uh, short algorithm uh, that could work once a powerful quantum computer will exist. We have a Groover algorithm to speed up the research in unstructured database. And after all, we have a collection of algorithms that can be pure quantum or hybrid to solve some physical chem chemical simulation for chemistry, materials, biology, uh, a lot of use case around combinator combinatorial optimization or operational research with uh, some routing problem, optimization of smart weight of renewable energy, finance, logistics. Uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, with machine learning and deep learning, we, has, we are seeing also a lot of potential use cases. But let's come back to our main discussion today. Uh, quantum technology could definitively contribute to all sustainable development goals. We can spot like, and let's take those um, three rounds. So objective number seven, affordable and clean energy. Quantum technology could be used to design new materials to increase the efficiency of solar cells, for instance, or to create better batteries or improve the simulation of plasma for a fusion reactor. We can think about the better integration of renewable energy in smart grid and also a lot of possibility to limit uh, CO2, uh, CO2 emission. Regarding objective two, no longer, more, we can think about the use case where we can produce uh, more efficiently nitrogen fertilizer and make them even more affordable to the population in some, some countries. Objective 13, climate action, action. So here, once again, we can design new catalysts, have a better computational fluid dynamics model, so lim limiting the consumption of uh, fuel fossil fuel for planes or cars, for instance, to design a better design, enfin, uh, better, uh, be, be, better shape for, 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 for the plane, for instance, uh, better routes for logistics. And also, of course, we, we have this uh, uh, question about the quantum computer power consumption that could be a solution to the over consumption of the conventional high performance computers. I show you this slide a few months ago. Uh, BCG has published an interesting notes on how quantum computer can tackle some problems linked to the climate change and at which horizon. Uh, I will detail here the fertilizer impact that could happen in the next five to 10 years with a high positive impact in terms of, of carbon. And I, I put the link if you are interested to know more, don't hesitate to jump on this excellent uh, study. So let's go to the so-called Aberbosch process that has been developed at the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the principle is it fixes atmospheric nitrogen in the form of ammonia, which in turn enables the synthesis of nitrogen fertilizers. As such, it is probably the most important industrial process ever developed this century since synthetic fertilizers are now able uh, are used to feed half of the world's population. But the Aberbosch process actually requi requires catalysis at high temperature and pressure. It's about 500 degrees Celsius and 100 bar. So it is largely dependent on the use of fossil fuels and it is therefore deemed to consume 2% of the world's energy and to contribute significantly to greenhouse emission, greenhouse gas emissions by releasing 1.4% of the world's CO2. However, an equivalent process of nitrogen fixation exists in nature under normal temperature and pressure conditions. It involves bacteria containing an enzyme complex 
name uh, nitrogenase, capable of catalyzing the transformation of nitrogen into the ammonium, which can be assimilated by plants. So this natural process is mysterious. It's slow, but being able to imitate, it will provide enormous environmental benefits. It will then be possible to create synthetic green fertilizer. One solution will be to model uh, the active site of nitrogenase using a conventional digital simulator or supercomputer or HPC, high performance computer. Unfortunately, these computers are not powerful enough for this type of problem. Indeed, the simulation of the behavior of the molecule depends on quantum physics equations, which are certainly known, but whose resolution quickly becomes too complex when the number of molecules, uh, when the molecule contains too many atoms interacting with each other, it's the so-called n-body problems. If you are interested in this topic, it's worth mentioning the Quantum for Climate Initiative, which has published a paper available in archive with an assessment of the impact of quantum computing in climate science by thematics like uh, solar energy, wind energy, etc., and also by type of modelization or simulation where quantum computing can bring some value. You will find uh, in the PowerPoint in PDF uh, the link to this paper. So. If algorithms are ready and multiverse computing contributes significantly in this uh, way, the quantum hardware is not yet fully ready. The two main challenges are those related to decoherence, the fact that qubits lose the quantum state of superposition of entanglement when they are interact with the environment. And the other point is the error rate when operating on, on qubit. When you are interacting with a qubit, you want to control them, and there is a lot of error uh, from that. So the objective today of the research is to improve coherence time, improve the fidelity rate of quantum operation, and one need is uh, from the research is to search for new materials to improve the way we control the qubit, and also another lead is to use error correction code or algorithm to uh, tackle the, the problem of error. So what next for quantum computing? Well, I'll let you read this one. I know it's a little wordy, but in the current area of quantum computing, the community is seeking to use physical qubits despite the error and the imperfection by designing either custom algorithms and use error mitigation effect. But for the future era of fault tolerance, we search for a way to build logical qubits from physical qubits. This means that we will uh, be able to put in place some quantum error correction uh, process in which logical qubits are encoded using a large number of physical qubits. So it is considered by the experts that it will take on average 10,000 physical qubits to form only one logical qubit. And in other words, if you want to create a 100 logical qubits into a computer, a quantum computer, we will need 1 million physical qubits. And as a reminder, today IBM only propose, only offers 137 qubits on the cloud. So we see that the path is still long. I put a tentative roadmap in terms of when the different kind of quantum computer will happen. Uh, we are definitively uh, in the NISC area. We are at our, at our disposal. We have quantum annealer, but full tolerant quantum computer gate, fully programmable. It's between uh, 10 to perhaps 20 years. So it's come back to uh, this point. One million qubits. Let's come back to the energy question. So at the first glance, uh, the energy cost of quantum computing is several orders of magnitude lower than classical computers. There, there is a difference of three orders of magnitude when you compare uh, the energy consumption of D-Wave quantum annealers to the most powerful supercomputer named uh, Fugaku from uh, Fujitsun in Japan. We are going from kilowatt -hour to uh, megawatt -hour. But the equation is not so simple because the energetic footprint depends on the qubit technology, but 
Anyway, it's like comparing apples and oranges because today quantum computers are not as powerful as conventional computers. Uh, an estimation to uh, for one million qubits go from uh, one hundred fifty three megawatt with a raw architecture without uh, any optimization to eventually only less than forty kilowatt for an optimized setup. So I get those numbers from a hardware software, uh, hardware quantum company. So the question actually regarding quantum computing energetic footprint is an open question and also a research topic. I put here an excellent article from uh, Alexia Ofe, who is calling from a quantum energy initiative. And so that's all for me. I finish. I leave the floor to Sam for the next part. And Sam, don't hesitate to tell me when I have to change. Uh, because I have the control on the slide right now. Understood. Uh, thank you, Michel. Um, so my name is Sam I, I work in the same company as Michel. Uh, we're both employees of uh, Multiverse Computing. Um, I'm the uh, CTO and Michel is our CEO in France. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a fantastic journey. We're now almost uh, 50 people. Uh, most of us have PhDs. We're mainly uh, uh, quantum computing researchers. We've got some excellent talent in uh, finance as well, in um, artificial intelligence and, and classical programming. Um, and essentially, um, you can think of us as a, um, we started out as a fintech um, bringing really trying to find uh, applications for quantum computing inside of industry. Um, we actually started out initially as a not-for-profit, and uh, this was about uh, five years ago, I believe, uh, called the Quantum World Association. And so this is where me and my co-founders met and realized that something really important was happening in quantum computing. And uh, so decided to incorporate as a company. Um, we mainly, so initially we, we mainly worked with banks, um, and, uh, this slide is on our main, uh, our kind of star product that I'll tell you about in a second. Um, <clears throat> and our strategy is through diverse proof of concepts. Um, we're building a software stack that tackles many industrial use cases and integrating that to deploy to customers. Um, the interesting thing is that we've started to be approached by customers outside of finance as well. And so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. And uh, some of these applications are, are, are potentially very impactful towards, um, towards green energy. Um, okay, so now you know a little bit more about the company, let me tell you about what we actually do. Um, so early on, as part of this not-for-profit, we realized that uh, the low-hanging fruits um, in finance for uh, quantum computing were in uh, capital markets applications. Uh, part of the reason is because uh, quantum optimization hardware is uh, kind of the most mature hardware that we have at the moment. Um, and additionally, it made a lot of sense for us as a company because everyone understands a problem that's portfolio optimization and everyone understands like what it means to make a difference and what the returns on investments are. And additionally, there's, there's a lot of really interesting topics that you can apply this. So, uh, to, uh, such as, um, well, related topics in finance, like index tracking, portfolio stress testing, things like that. Um, so the problem that we're tackling here is we'd like to um, optimize the returns for an investor that wants to build a portfolio of investment um, without exceeding a predefined risk. Um, and this is a dynamic optimization problem, which means we're not only interested in buying a set of assets and holding them, we want to find the best sequence of buys and sells um, to solve this, to, for investment. And we know that the solutions to this uh, problem are given by this um, meaty equation here on the left, uh, 
where mu is the forecasted returns, um, the central term is uh, the risk, and then the last term is the transaction costs. And when we saw that this a very difficult problem is uh, well adapted to be solved on a uh, D-Waves quantum computer. And so this is what we did on the REC. These are some results that we published in collaboration with Keisha. We've done several projects with them. Um, and we were optimizing a, a portfolio of investments spanning a one-year period with daily transactions. Um, and this is a huge problem. It's mind-bogglingly big. Um, and we found that by simply randomly sampling the state, the solution space of all solutions, we found all this cloud of, of blue portfolios over here. And the portfolios that Keisha was offering over this one year period, I think this was 2019 to 2020, uh, were in the kind of like high risk, high return corner of this cloud. So, I should have started by saying the x-axis is volatility or risk and the y-axis is your returns. And we found that with our quantum algorithms, we were able to approach the efficient frontier. And so specifically, without changing the risk, we were able to increase profit a lot. So this was a result we were really happy to present. Michel, could I have the next slide? This is a piece of work that we're doing in collaboration with Crédit Agricole. It's probably our most interesting and ambitious project. Um, so Crédit Agricole has to daily price exotic options. So these are extremely complex financial um, um, instruments. And this is a problem that every, every bank has, essentially. And it's a very difficult problem to solve, and it's their main um, uh, computational cost, essentially. They have servers running 24 hours a day trying to solve this problem. <laughs> and the reason why it's so difficult is because uh, traditionally you solve it with uh, Monte Carlos and your price today is dependent on what's going to happen in the future. And so you need these, uh, these like billions of simulations to get a reliable result. Uh, there's recently been a um, really interesting piece of work um, for using neural networks to solve this problem instead of nested Monte Carlos. And, um, there are also some downsides with this. Uh, training is very difficult, and there's a high dependence on your training set. Our idea was let's use some instruments that come directly from physics called tensor networks. This is different from TensorFlow. Um, and we can insert this in the neural network, and this will allow for faster training, a better use of memory, and also less variance on the data set. So this is, and we're obtaining some, some extremely promising uh, results in this uh, direction and um, for this very high value problem. So this is something that we'd be quite excited to uh, potentially really reduce one of the main computational sort of, uh, costs for bank in this way. And maybe I should emphasize this uses only classical hardware. So this is really good towards saying, it's kind of a, a change of paradigm. You're saying, okay, we have quantum physics, quantum physics is, uh, quantum computing is great, but there's some ideas that come out of quantum computing that can actually affect uh, high performance computing as well. So this is kind of what this project is about. Could I have the next slide? So I think this is maybe a project that would be of the most interest for you. This is a project that we're working on with Repsol and uh, with BBVA. So we started, our first client was BBVA and we were working on portfolio optimization with them. And eventually they came back with Repsol and Repsol said to us, um, look, we've got a problem that's actually very similar to portfolio optimization. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Repsol is a big petrochemical company, but they're also a big electricity provider in, um, 
in Spain. And so Repsol said, uh, look, you have to find the optimal investments based on um, supply and demand uh, forecasts, on, on forecasts of what the market's going to do. And we need to take the optimal energy management decisions based on like supply electric, supply and demand like forecasts. So they're actually very similar mathematically problems. And so RepSolve's problem is we have all these individuals that are, that are producing their own energy, they have means to store their own energy, and then they have to take decisions. Am I using my own energy or am I selling it back to the grid? Um, for Repsol, every single person like this looks like a miniature power plant and they need to decide, am I buying their electricity or am I, am I selling them electricity? And then on the scale of a country, this decision becomes a really, really big problem, like who to buy from and how much to sell for. And so this is a problem that we're using quantum computing and in particular, again, D-Wave, but also INQ's platform to tackle this problem at the moment. Could I have the next slide? The final application that I'll present is a project we're working on with Bosch, and this has to do with smart manufacturing, what's called digital twins, so to make a whole twin of your uh, factory but simulated, and then you can try things out, you know, what happens if I change my process in this way, and uh, this is extremely interesting for um, for supply chain optimization, but also uh, we're heavily involved in predictive maintenance with them. And so these are all like very, very valuable uh, uh, problems that directly impact industry with which quantum computing games can help. Could I have the last slide? Uh, fantastic. So and uh, just to tell you a bit more about the company, so the idea is we've got all these use cases and we're currently amassing all of this into one big central toolbox and, and then we plan to license that to customers. Um, in the back end, uh, the, the toolbox accesses superconducting, photonic, ionotrap, neutral atom hardware, and also these sensor networks algorithms that I spoke about. And in the front end, we tried to make it an interface that's very, very friction free for, for like customers and engineers from diverse, diverse backgrounds to access. Um, can I have the last slide? Excellent. Uh, Michelle, back over to you. Okay, thank you, Sam. So we are at the end. We will leave some spaces for questions. So some takeaway, uh, take home message. So <coughs> quantum technology forms a, a new paradigm that has the potential to disrupt various sectors with application in energy, chemistry, finance. There is plenty of short term gains. Low hanging prints, as uh, Sam said, from applying quantum and quantum inspired uh, uh, techniques for industry. Um, Multiverse is, uh, is, is working with Fortune 500 to explore such quantum capability and get uh, some benefits. And Multiverse is also deploying singularity to the cloud as a toolbox for the mass, uh, because we are, we are sure that uh, behind the tools, behind the toolbox, the user will be not a, a physicist, a PhD in physics. So we try to propose singularity for the mass. And today we have uh, some application in industry, in energy management has uh, been exposed by, uh, by Sam. So that's it for us. Uh, we have uh, eventually a uh, few, few minutes for, for any question, if you want. Maybe I can, uh, I can break the ice with, uh, with the first question. So, um, uh, obviously, in Grenon RWA, we are committing to uh, help banks to finance the net zero transition. And, and listening to your presentation, which, by the way, was super interesting, uh, uh, we clearly see that there is a lot of potential in quantum computing. But on the other side, we also see that there is a lot of bets. Uh, it's, there's no guarantee it will work, and, and there is no guarantee what will be the best use case and so on. So, so I was wondering how the financial world can be banks, venture capital and so on and so forth are actually financing the quantum technology uh, ecosystem. 
Uh, and do you think there is some improvement that could be done in, in, in the way we, we, we finance this vital debt for humankind? It's fine. Do you take this one? You have experience with the banks? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll throw my impressions out and, and maybe uh, Michelle you can take over afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's an absolutely great question. I think banks see the potential. A lot of players in the financial industry also see quantum as a risk. Obviously, they like lots of these players have a very strong head start, and they don't want anyone to jump in and, and eat their lunch essentially. Um, and um, I think the way that a lot of banks are choosing to, to be a player and finance this is to, on the one hand, form reading groups and have like people in their company that are experts on the topic, but also um, to, to jump in and, and conduct proof of concepts with startups and just like realize the, realize the potential of quantum in this way. Um, Michel? Would you have anything to add to that? Yes, I will say there is no general answer because uh, on the same uh, territory uh, with the same uh, kind of banks, you will see that uh, there is also some risk aversion toward investment in quantum, in quantum world. Uh, when, it's, when the things are going well, uh, when the bank is uh, spending uh, 500 million a year on their IT department, there are no problem to finance uh, a proof of concept spending a few hundred, few hundred thousand or even one million euro with uh, several companies to do some research and development. For them, it's research and development and they are not expecting uh, any return. It's just research. But other banks are very uh, uh, cautious around this one and they would like to be sure and so they are waiting. So there is as usual, with new technology, you have early adopters like Cassib in France, like Goldman Sachs that have hired a team of five or six physicists that are working on quantum computing. So they are advertising, they are making public some of their work, but I'm sure that on top of that, perhaps they have already very interesting results that keep secret, of course. So there is no general answer, but there are banks that are keen to do some investment, although they are just waiting a little. Thank you. Okay, and... Uh, uh, Another question? Yes, maybe. Go <laughs> ahead. Well, well, maybe you can start. <laughs> you were. Uh, Asan? You can uh, ask the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this uh, interesting presentation. The, uh, maybe something I missed is uh, today to solve the problems you mentioned. Uh, which hardware do you use uh, today in uh, when you interact with those companies? Something yeah, I that's a great question. Um, we so we we say that we're hardware agnostic so we've got um expertise and, and we've developed expertise in really all types of hardware so we're working currently with uh, ibm d-wave uh, alpine quantum computing pascal ionq xanadu and i've probably forgotten some like and i think part of the value that we bring is to really understand like okay if i want to do a quantum accelerated monte carlo application then i know that an ionic platform like ionq is the most suited for that because they have long coherence times, they have very high gate fidelities. So we, I think part of the value that we bring is to understand how we're going to solve the problem and also what's the best hardware to solve it on. Um, and there's also like uh, business model reasons why it makes a lot of sense to not be tied to one single hardware vendor, basically. Understood. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Asana. Thomas, you have a question? 
Yes, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a very interesting topic, and uh, we are also working in. in we have big interest in uh, quantum uh, computing in uh, our company. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering. Uh, I just have to uh, maybe one remark and one question. Uh, one remark is that you uh, you you made it clear that the, the planning to have a. a, a, a um, a full tolerance. A full, uh, a full working computer, a quantum computer, uh, it won't be before uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, let's say something like that. Uh, how do you see the role of uh, quantum computing uh, in uh, energy transition and uh, net zero compliance uh, to uh, 2050? Uh, so, because I, for me, for me, uh, it will be uh, <clears throat> it will be a, maybe a, a little too late for that <laughs> uh, when uh, when the 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 full tolerant uh, quantum computer will be uh, will be on the market, or at least uh, will be uh, uh, available for use uh, for uh, for this purpose. I think that, uh, for instance, regarding the application in chemistry, and chemistry is really seen as a one one of the sector where we will have the first uh, added value from quantum computing, even with the actual materials, the actual quantum culture. Uh, we, we spoke and we quote uh, Richard Feynman with a uh, way we can simulate the nature with a quantum computer, because, which is uh, using the same rules as the nature. And the capacity to design, for instance, better materials for battery uh, is something that I think will come in the very next few years. We are not talking here about 10 years to 15 years. So we will see a mm. very specific case in the next few years some uh, quantum advantage on some specific problem. It, it will be not a universal advantage. It will be not a general advantage. Uh, we will, can cope with the existing quantum computer with the error. Uh, we know they are error prone. We know that they are limited uh, in number of gates in ter and in terms of fidelity, right? But effectively, it's a research to put in place some algorithm that can tackle this error, uh, that can create logical qubits, um, for instance, for universal gates. But before that, we know that there is some specific qubits that, can, that are well shaped for doing uh, chemistry simulation, for instance, for small molecules, but okay. it can, for instance, involve lithium with another uh, component that can bring additional value compared to the actual component in battery. We are not talking about uh, health, health science, for instance. We are not talking, uh, talking about uh, uh, complex protein or peptide. We are just talking about small molecule in chemistry and we know that today uh, above uh, five or six atoms it's quite difficult for a classical computer to to, to model the, the, the exactly the behavior of molecule and it will be available for quantum computers mm. actually something i'd like to add to that is um so just going in the direction of what michelle said it's it's important to realize that it's not a a quantum computer that's not fault tolerant can also add value, and, and this is the value we're looking for today. Um, and as an example of that, did you know that the computer that put people on the moon was not a fault tolerant computer? Mm. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even the the first Pentium computer <laughs> processor were not fault tolerant. <laughs> Exactly. Um, uh, 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 if I may, just one more question: uh, Do you have a, also any application in uh, climate modeling? So not at present. Uh, this is something that we're uh, looking at. Well, the, where we're going to go, and we've actually received a uh, grant from the part of the European Union to explore this. But at present, we've actually had very little applications in um, in 
uh, chemistry and in environmental sciences. So, um, no. Mm. But the, 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 there is some some question around the capacity to resolve, for instance, uh, partial partial derivative equation uh, for uh, uh, weather prediction and CTV, perhaps. Uh, Quantum computer is strong to, uh, for certain cases, to resolve linear uh, systems. So, uh, combining uh, PDE linear system, uh, perhaps we can modelize. It's like, uh, f finally, it's like uh, modelizing the, the fluid, uh, fluid uh, dynamics for airplanes or cars. It's the same, same question. Yeah, okay, this uh, is a really good point. Uh, Actually, so, uh, I, I, I was more uh, thinking about uh, complex interaction between uh, between climate economic models uh, to uh, to really have a financial application because this is the the main topic today with uh, Green uh, AWA, of course, <laughs> and uh, we are really working on a uh, on specific interaction between uh, climate, uh, supply chain, and uh, macro and microeconomics uh, uh, parameters. So um, <clears throat> I don't know if, uh, if, it, if quantum computing is something that can add uh, some value in that in that uh, specific field. I, I, I think somehow, I mean, the, 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 the nature of the problem is similar to uh, optimizing uh, 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 portfolio management uh, return. You know, I mean, you have a constraint, you have an objective function, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we know that quantum computer can be very efficient in that space. So for instance, I mean, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, Algorithm like the CERN, for instance, I mean the one we have developed, and uh, and uh, in, in AWA and um, stochastic climate model we have designed for the calibration. I mean, you know, it's a, it's nothing else than a Monte Carlo simulation, so it could be it could be simulated on a kind of, on a kind of computer if we need to um, have you know a large degree of number of degree of liberty uh, on, on the on the modeling. Yeah. So, of course. Thank you. So I, I think we are uh, we are there of the time. So maybe maybe it's time to um, maybe it's time to conclude. Um, so uh, as a whole, I mean, thank you very much, uh, Michel and Sam. Uh, I think it was uh, really interesting, not not an easy topic to explain to non-specialized. I mean, uh, I know that by by experience, but you, you did very well, and 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 I think all the use cases you explore. Was, was super interesting because at the end of the day, that 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 one matters. So, thank you for your uh, for your uh, explanation on that. And 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 just my conclusion. I would like to have a, a positive conclusion. A very positive conclusion is when when we listen to you. I mean, we realize that there is no limit in our world. I mean, the the only limit is our technology capabilities. There is no limit in nature. Uh, somehow, I mean, listen to you. Uh, uh, I was wondering is maybe the future of human being is not on Mars, but on the Hilbert space. And there is more freedom on the Hilbert, Hilbert space than on Mars. So, so I think that's, that's a very positive message for the future of our planet and the future of, of humankind. And, and congratulations for your uh, efforts to make this happen. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>